Hello there, Blogging Heads audience. This is Glenn Lowry of The Glenn Show. Um, Glenn Show coming to you from the Watson Institute for Public and International Affairs at Brown University, with which I'm affiliated. Uh, I'm currently uh, in Toulouse, France, and I'm not complaining about that. Uh, and I'm joined today by Patrick Brown, Dr. Patrick Brown, who is a PhD in uh, Earth and Ocean Science from Duke University, currently a postdoctoral research fellow at the Carnegie Institution for Science at Stanford University. Uh, welcome, Patrick. Thanks a lot. It's great to be on the Glenn Show. Why is Glenn Lowry, who is a professor of the social sciences at Brown University, talking to Patrick Brown, who is a uh, young scientist working on climate change issues at Stanford? The uh, reason is that in a previous episode, I said something I think is probably pretty foolish. <laughs> I said, how do I know that uh, weather on the sun or volcanic activity under the uh, surface of the earth couldn't have as much impact long term on uh, uh, climate problems for us human beings as uh, the burning of fossil fuels? And I got an avalanche of complaints from people saying, you don't know what the F you, you're talking about. And it's true. I don't know a whole lot about the subject. But Patrick does. So um, he uh, kindly volunteered to come on and educate the rest of us on, uh, on these issues, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, we have a, a little bit of an outline or a framework here about what we want to do. Um, and I would tell you uh, that I really need to start with the basics. Uh, how do we know uh, that, uh, how do we know uh, what's causing climate change? How do we know the climate is changing? How do we know what the sources of the change are? How do we know that human activity is important in that? Uh, that's the first question that I want to put to you, Patrick, and um, we can take it from there uh, because the climate apparently is changing. How do we know that? Uh, we think that human activity is causing it. How do we know that? I want to know. Uh, we think there's some things that can be done about it, and I'd really like to hear what you think about that, because that seems like a thorny issue to an economist, how do we know what to do and how do we balance the costs and such. Um, and then right. this issue of uh, people are talking about that climate change is a hoax because they don't trust the community of scientists who are telling us. I mean, on the one hand, people say uh, the consensus among scientists is so great that this is what's going on. On the other hand, uh, you have like the East Anglia fiasco where emails leak out and it looks like the community of progressive scientists are leading this around by the nose and so on. So that's the territory I hope that we could cover. Yeah, sounds great. Um, yeah, so we can just start with, uh, you know, how do we know that the climate is changing currently? And so, you know, I think one important thing to emphasize th emphasize throughout this is the different levels of confidence we have in different conclusions. And so to start off with, um, what we have very high confidence in is that the Earth is getting warmer uh, currently on the decade-to-decade -decade time scale. And so you can start with um, looking at meteorological station records that go back to the late 1800s. We've recorded temperatures over the surface of the land, and we've seen a pronounced warming over that time period. We see that confirmed with sea surface temperature records that come from ships and buoys. They also go back to the 1800s. Uh, we see that with sea level rise data sets, which um, originally came from uh, tide gauges, but more recently have been measured by satellites. And so sea level is rising because uh, ice is melting, as well as because the ocean waters actually expand as they get warmer. And so uh, we've seen sea level rise. We've seen alpine glaciers uh, decline in mass. We've seen uh, the Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ice sheet decline in mass. Um, and we can measure that from satellites. So there's, there's a very cool satellite called the GRACE satellite, which is basically a pair of satellites that have a laser um, going between them. And when they move over different portions of the Earth, tiny variations in gravity pulls one of the satellites down slightly and so you can measure that difference in the laser. And then as the other satellite goes over, that one goes down slightly. And so over time, you can measure changes in mass on the surface of the planet, and you can measure changes in mass of the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. And we've seen, since those satellites have been up in 2002, 
that there's been a pronounced decrease in the mass of the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets, which is what we would expect uh, as the temperature uh, gets warmer. Uh, we see this in weather balloon data, basically any data set that's global that uh, spans multiple decades, we see a increase in temperature. Um, and so that this is like one of the most um, robust findings. Well, uh, let me ask you something about that. Okay, so we see an increase in temperature, looking at rising sea level, looking at reduced ice cover or whatever. Is this unprecedented in the history of the Earth? I gathered that ice uh, ages have come and gone. Um, is what we're seeing big relative to what has transpired in the, in the past history of the planet? So the primary concern is not necessarily the magnitude, but the rate of change. So, so far, what we've seen since the Industrial Revolution is about one degree Celsius of warming. And so if you uh, prefer Fahrenheit, you multiply that by 1.8. So about 1.8 uh, degrees Fahrenheit uh, change in global average uh, temperature. Now, the change from the last ice age to what we call the Holocene, which is essentially the stable um, warmer climate that we've seen over the past 10,000 years, that change was about five degrees Celsius. So that's about five times larger than what we've seen so far since the Industrial Revolution. But if you look at where we're projected to go over the next 100 years, say, we're projected to, to rise another three maybe degrees Celsius. So you're talking about the same order of magnitude change, but about 10 times faster than the change that we saw from the last ice age to the present. Um, and so that's, that's the primary concern, is that we're, we're essentially conducting an experiment where we're changing the climate faster than we have ever seen it change before in about the same order of magnitude as we've seen um, when there's been very you know, large uh, impacts from these climate changes. So just to give you an example, for the, for the last ice age, there was about a mile of ice over all of Canada and over a lot of Eurasia. Um, so a mile of ice all the way down to Boston in terms of mile of ice high. And that, that is only represents about five degrees Celsius change in global average temperature. So it may not sound like a whole lot, you know, relative to how much change we get from day to night and from season to season, but five degrees of average temperature over the globe, it means a lot in terms of what the average, what the global climate uh, is like. And so, yeah, just to, just to go back to your question, we don't know of any global average changes in climate except for potentially uh, when asteroids have struck the Earth that are as fast and as large a magnitude combined as what we're talking about over the next, you know, 100, 200 years under like a business as usual type. Uh, scenario in terms of emissions. Let me make sure I understand. So since, let's say, 1800, or roughly so, 200, 225 years, we've observed a one degree Celsius increase in average uh, temperature, which is not unprecedented in the history of the Earth, although the rate at which that temperature increase has occurred uh, in this last uh, two centuries plus is much greater than what we have observed from any natural causes of climate change other than, you say, uh, extraterrestrial uh, striking of the... And we do know that that has occurred. Uh, I'm just asking. Um, uh, yeah, so like the last prominent one was the end Cretaceous extinction that killed the dinosaurs. And so that killed like 75% of species on the planet. So the, you know, and, and we think a lot of that has to do with the climate change that came afterwards, not necessarily the impact itself. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, climate change is one of the main reasons that we've seen mass extinction events uh, in the past. So, so I'm not entirely crazy to think that there are natural events that could cause changes that dwarf the effects of human activity. And we haven't yet begun to talk about how we know human activity is involved, but just stipulating for a moment that human activity is involved. It's not incorrect to say that there are events nat natural and um, uh, in nature that could induce uh, similar changes. It's just a question of how likely those events are relative to what we know to be the effects of human activities. Yeah, it's not incorrect. We know from looking at the uh, geological record that there that climate change is kind of the rule rather than the exception. Uh, 
Um, but yeah, I would emphasize again that it's the rate of change that is particularly unusual uh, as far as what's going on right now. Um, and that that seems like that's not something that we that we see very often in the geological record, if at all. Okay, so then um, uh, let's move on. As we've established, you've established, uh, to my satisfaction, in any case that uh, climate is changing and that it's changing rapidly relative to the Earth's historical experience. Uh, what is the evidence and, and how does the scientific community uh, assess the extent to which human activity is responsible uh, for this recent uh, uptick in average global temperature? So this fundamentally rests basically on fundamental physical arguments, so fundamental physics. So we've known about what we call the greenhouse effect since the 1800s. So Joseph Fourier uh, was the first one to speculate that the atmosphere has this effect that causes the Earth's surface to be warmer than it would be otherwise. And essentially the way to think about it is it's kind of like a blanket, that it it inhibits the amount of energy leaving the surface of the planet and causes the Earth to be warmer than it would be otherwise. So these gases in the atmosphere, in particular water vapor and carbon dioxide and methane and nitrous oxide, uh, they selectively allow light in from the sun, but at the same time they don't allow the heat radiation from the Earth to escape to space as easily. They're relatively opaque to that. And so Fourier was the first one to... Um, basically make calculations that showed this. And then uh, John Tyndall later, later in the 18th century was the first one to, do, to run experiments where you basically shine different wavelengths of light through gases and see what comes out on the other side. And so he was the first one to show that, yeah, this actually exists. And then by 1896, um, a man named Svante Arrhenius was publishing papers speculating about how humans burning fossil fuels would change the surface temperature of the planet. So there's been a lot of science accumulated on this. This is not something that uh, came out, you know, from Al Gore in 2007 or something. This is something that uh, is, has a very strong foundation that there's, that we know that the greenhouse effect exists. We know that certain gases like carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, methane are greenhouse gases. Now we know that burning fossil fuels, uh, increases these greenhouse gas concentrations. And you can see this very obviously in, um, for example, if you want to reconstruct uh, atmospheric record of CO2, you can drill down into ice cores, and the ice cores have trapped bubbles from previous uh, years. And you can count the years because there's layers for every single season. And so you can go back in time and you can sample the air in... Um, from previous uh, years. And so you can reconstruct, for example, CO2 over a thousand years. And basically what you see is it was just flat uh, at about 280 parts per million for a long time. And then as soon as the Industrial Revolution happened and we started burning fossil fuels and putting CO2 into the atmosphere, well, you see that CO2 spikes. And so it's gone up about 40% uh, since then. And so Basically, we know that burning fossil fuels increases carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere and other greenhouse gases. We know physically that this should increase the surface temperature of the planet. We've observed that this has, in fact, increased the surface temperature of the planet. Um, these predictions were made beforehand, so it's not just a correlation causation issue where you you know, see CO2 has increased, and you see temperature has increased, and you're speculating that they're related to each other. You know, the key to science is predictions, and predictions were made ahead of time. And even in the, in the 70s, global climate models were predicting uh, how much warming we'd see t by today, and those have largely come true. And in a lot of cases, they've underestimated how much warming we've seen between the late 70s uh, and today. And so, the point on that is just that we that that is just very basic fundamental uh, physics. And so, if anyone if anyone has a theory that would counter that, that would be you know Nobel Prize worthy, and it would be absolutely um, you know ground shaking. Uh, 
And so there's a huge incentive for someone to come along and to prove that wrong, and no one's been able to do it uh, since the since the 1800s when it was first proposed. And so that's very solid science. Um, and then you know, then you would also be thinking about okay, what are the natural factors that could cause climate change on these timescales? So on centennial timescales or decade to decade timescales, changes in output from the sun and changes in large volcanic eruptions have a big effect on surface temperature. And when we investigate those, and the reason we know that is because when, when we look back over the past, say, thousand years, uh, changes in temperature correlate quite well with changes in uh, solar output and changes in large volcanic eruptions, which you have to reconstruct from various lines of evidence because obviously we don't have uh, clean instrumental records of those things. But if you look at what's been going on in the 20th century and into the 20, 21st century with volcanic eruptions and solar output, those things have not uh, contributed to warming. So if anything, they've contributed to cooling. And so what that means is that if you do a fractional attribution where you say how much of the warming that we've seen is from human activity, you get a number that's centered on 100%, basically. Um, so it's not, it, it's not like it's, you know, okay, it's 50% and the other half is natural. It's the center is 100% because it could be more than 100%. Because if, if natural changes are negative, then yeah, it would be more. How could that be? Is it that blocking solar radiation from the dust that might come out of a volcanic eruption? Yeah, exactly. So the sulfate aerosols go into the atmosphere and they... Um, reflect solar energy back to space. And so actually, the, you know, people think about the climate system and how complicated it is, and it is complicated. But when you're talking about global average temperature, there's really only three ways to change it because it's a, it's a first law of thermodynamics problem. You can change the energy in that's coming in from the sun. You can change how much is reflected back to space. So that would be like these volcanic eruptions that put a bunch of soot and aerosols into the atmosphere and cause more solar energy to be reflected back to space and thus less coming in. Or you can change how much uh, the Earth is radiating energy to space. So that would be like changing the greenhouse effect. So there's only three ways. And um, we know that, that basically um, the natural causes of climate change that have been uh, prominent in the past, like changes... Uh, that were responsible for the ice ages are not active right now, are not um, responsible for the current warming. I see. So what, what has been the history of fluctuation in solar radiation uh, over long time spans? Well, so we know very well what solar radiation has done over the past several decades because we've had satellites actually looking at the sun and measuring how much radiation is coming from the sun. Going back prior to that, you have to do some type of a, a reconstruction based on sunspots. So people have been looking at the sun for a long time through telescopes and counting how many sunspots there are. And there's turns out there's a correlation between um, sunspots are just these uh, phenomena that occur on the surface of the sun that are uh, darker than, than average. And it turns out when there's more sunspots, the sun actually is uh, releasing more energy towards the Earth. But anyway... Um, you can reconstruct sunspots going back in time and then kind of re get an idea of how solar radiation has changed over time. And it's not too uh, dramatic. So the sun's output is relatively steady. And uh, so that hasn't been a big contributor in terms of the sun itself actually changing the climate. What does end up being a big contributor is how the Earth's orbit is oriented relative to the sun. So the, the main cause of these ice age cycles is how the Earth's orbit is oriented relative to the sun. So when you have the, um, the plane of rotation kind of tilted towards the sun, that means you have winters and you have summers that are warmer and winters that are colder. And it turns out that in order to get an ice age, you want uh, summers to be cool and winters to be relatively warm, which may seem a little bit counterintuitive, but what happens is what, when the summer is cool, the snow from the previous winter can survive the summer 
and then snow from the next winter falls on top of that, and then that can happen year after year after year, and you build up an ice sheet, and you can cause an ice age. What, 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 um, uh, I'm sorry for these simple questions, but what does cause the change in the orientation or attitude of the Earth uh, on its axis as it's spinning and also rotating around the sun? Just uh, the interaction of gravity from different planets in the solar system uh -huh. and how they, how they pull and tug on each other. I see. Okay, so we're pretty clear that the temperature is rising. We're pretty clear about the greenhouse gas effect and about the thermodynamic uh, sort of account for what can cause temperature change. We're pretty clear that CO2 in the atmosphere has increased over the course of the industrial age. And so we're pretty clear that human activity, I'm summarizing and correct me if I get this wrong, is implicated. Uh, and indeed, when we try to measure what fraction of the observed change in the uh, average temperature on the Earth can be attributed to this greenhouse effect mediated process, we conclude that it's at least all of it. Yeah. <laughs> Our best estimate is all of it, yeah. You know, the range would be, you know, 90% to 110% type of thing. But yeah, the best estimate would be all. And there is really no disagreement amongst well-informed people about anything that you've said to this point. I would say no, that is pretty uncontroversial. Um, what ends up being more controversial is what we'll get into probably later about projections and about how bad it necessarily is. But yeah, what I've said so far is I can't think of any credible, you know, scientist. You, see, you of course, see people on Twitter and et cetera, you know, yeah. uh, arguing about that. But, um, yeah, what, I, what I've said so far is not controversial. Well, let's get on to talking about uh, what we think will happen in 100 years, 500 years, and uh, how accurate uh, is the science ability to forecast uh, going forward. Uh, the uh, implications for global warming of the processes that you've been describing? Yeah, so it's a tough question because, you know, to be totally honest, scientifically, we don't know, right? Like, we've never made an 100-year forecast uh, for climate change before. Um, we can try to get an idea of how accurate that might be by, by doing, you know, back casts, by taking um, a climate model where we're essentially simulating the climate in a computer and putting in conditions, say, for the last uh, ice age and seeing if it can reproduce what we think the best conditions were or what we think um, is our best estimate of what the conditions were. And we can do things like that. Um, we can compare climate models to climate models we can do all sorts of, um, yeah, model intercomparisons and sensitivity tests. But the bottom line is we don't have a bunch of Earths to, do, to run experiments on, right? So we, you know, I, I come from like a meteorological background. Yeah. And in meteorology, um, you have the luxury, at least scientifically, of being able to run a model, you know, five days in advance, say, and then five days later, you know how well that model did. And you know exactly how well your forecast, you know how good you are at forecasting because you're constantly being um, humbled, you know, by your forecast. Where in climate science, we don't necessarily have that luxury because we are making projections out 100 years into the future and we don't have uh, the data in yet to see if it's, to see how valid it is. But having said that, these projections are made based on kind of basic physical principles and the models that are being used to make them um, more or less can reproduce climate changes of the past. Um, and so they, they represent our best physical understanding of the global climate system. And so they're the best things that we have and they're not going to get, um, you know, better necessarily by just, you know, until, until you wait and see, and see what happens. And that may not be uh, the best idea. So uh, I, I would say that, that, that various scientists have de various degrees of confidence in how well these models can project the future. In terms of the big picture, 
like how much global warming we expect for a given amount of increases in greenhouse gases. We have pretty high confidence in that. What we have less confidence in is kind of local scale changes or changes in uh, various weather phenomena. Like if you're, if you're interested in how tornadoes will, ch will change or how hurricanes will change or droughts, um, those things definitely have less confidence. Can you describe uh, briefly what the forecast uh, is, a kind of consensus forecast going forward uh, 100, 200 years uh, for, the, uh, for the problem that we've been discussing? Yeah, so m most of the uncertainty in future warming comes from uncertainty in socioeconomic demographic uh, type projections, right? So uh, that, you know, how much warming we get in the future depends on how much greenhouse gases people emit. And how many, how much greenhouse gases people emit depends on how technology will change, how population will change, how GDP will change, you know, all those things. Yeah. But so if we fix that for a second, if we just say, okay, we're going to assume some kind of middle of the road scenario in terms of emissions, um, then there's about a range. The factor is about a factor of two between the models that produce the most warming at the end of the century and the models that produce the least warming. And it's about the middle ground would be, um, you know, three to five degrees Celsius. Uh, compared to compared to pre-industrial. That's by 2100? Oh, that's yeah. compared to 1800. So another two to four degrees yeah. degrees relative to what's already occurred. Right. By right. the end of this century? Yeah. That's stupefying. Yeah. So, I mean, any impacts that we're seeing today, so for example, in California, you know, we, we do think that climate change is definitely implicated in the fires that we've seen. Um, you know, you're talking about these impacts being multiplied by two, three, four. Um, and, you know, of course, you can't assume that it's necessarily a one-to-one -one ratio and that it changes linearly. Some impacts would change super linearly and sub sublinearly. Well, hold on. Before we get to impacts, I'm just trying to understand what the forecast of the change is. And I, and I have a question that I want to ask about that. But first, I just want to take the, take the measure of, the, of what it is that you just said, if I understood you which is that the intermediate estimates of by the end of the 21st century, what degree of warming will have taken place are in the range of uh, four to five degrees, is that what you two to five degrees Celsius over uh, the temperature at the start of the industrial age. And we've already experienced a one degree Celsius increase. So we expect over the next 100 years to experience at least as much and perhaps three times as much uh, increase in the t Earth, uh, temperature as was observed in the past 200 years. Do I understand that correctly? Yes. So if I, I will just look, look at this directly off of uh, a chart. So if we're, we're at one right now, and the range for 2100 is three to five, essentially. Um, yeah, so it's, it's quite steep. Um, and again, this is where this, I, this important idea comes in about how fast this is relative to what we've seen in previous uh, climate changes okay. and why it's so concerning. I want to talk about what the scientific community believes the consequences of this temperature change would be. But first, I have to ask an economist question, which is, I assume these projections make assumptions about technology and about uh, the consuming habits and preferences of people. They must say something about whether we think electric power will continue to be generated by burning fossil fuels or whether nuclear fusion or something will come online and allow electricity to be generated without that side effect. They must say something about whether we expect developing countries to have 70, 80, or 90 percent of their people living in big cities or living in uh, rural areas, something about whether every person who becomes a middle class Chinese or Indian a consumer will have an air conditioner on a vehicle of their own and so on. Uh, what are you scientists assuming about these things? Because, and forgive me, I can remember forecasts from back in the 1970s when people were saying we were going to run out of this or that uh, irreplaceable uh, natural uh, uh, input that we need for industrial civilization. 
without reckoning that prices would rise and that would change the incentives of people and that would create an inducement to innovation and so on. And, and those, I remember them, was it uh, uh, Paul Ehrlich and uh, Julian Simon had some big wager about what was going to happen uh, 25 or 30 years out. And I, and I think the guy who was just extrapolating from past trends lost that bet. So you see yeah. what I'm getting at? Yeah. So first of all, I, I totally agree that um, that Malthusian predictions, as well as the predictions from Paul Ehrlich, uh, the population bomb, et cetera, are a good lesson for scientists. And it's, you know, it, it just shows how hard it is to predict the future. And if you extrapolate, you know, essentially what they were doing was saying, hey, look, uh, human population is increasing by this amount and uh, food production is only increasing by this amount. And so we're all going to starve and it's going to be a dystopia. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, they didn't anticipate the green revolution and that pesticides and fertilizers would cause this huge explosion in food production. And now we have more than enough food, even for uh, the population that has increased a huge amount um, from 1970. So I do think that, the, that it's important to look at past predictions and to be, uh, you know, humble whenever you're talking about uh, the future. Um, in terms of these projections into the future, uh, they, I wouldn't call them predictions. They're projections. They're basically, they're saying, assuming some story in terms of how technology and demographics, et cetera, change, this is what we would expect for temperature change. And so what I'm, what I'm referring to here with the three to five degrees Celsius increase, that corresponds to what um, geographers and demographers refer to as these shared socioeconomic pathways. So they have these five stories, essentially, about how the Earth or how global society may change in the 21st century. And they don't say, we think this one's more likely than this or, or anything like that. They just say, OK, here's, a, here's one plausible scenario. Here's four other plausible scenarios under these scenarios, which um, have different levels of population, different technology changes, different levels of GDP change, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is what we would expect in terms of emissions. And then you can feed that into a physical climate model and then get uh, answers in terms of, um, you know, how much warming you would, you would expect. And I, one, th one thing I did want to say about global climate models is that, you know, global climate models, especially among climate skeptics, get a bad reputation. But I just want to make the point that these are these are just based on physical equations. So if if you ask me how much warming we're, we expect by by 2100, and I say four degrees Celsius, and you say how did you get that number, and I say well math and physics, I just I looked at an equation and I calculated it. I think people are like oh okay that sounds good. But if I say I I got it from a climate model, people say oh well climate model i mean that's that could that could give you any answer but they more. are nothing but math and physics i think yeah exactly it's the same thing it's so it's and it's it's you know climate models run the gamut from being very simple it could be a single equation that's just based on the first law of thermodynamics or it could be millions of lines of code which are trying to simulate much more of the earth system um, but they're physical models. They're based on physics. They're based on conservation of mass, conservation of energy, conservation of momentum. They're not statistical extrapolations like some models are. Um, and I'm not pointing the finger at e economics. Well, I was, I was feeling a little uncomfortable. With you. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, when, when things are based on physical equations, I got it. Uh, we have more confidence in them. Than so let's talk a little bit about the impact of this uh, temperature uh, change for both uh, natural and uh, human systems. What, what, uh, what do you have to say about that? So this is where things definitely get more uncertain because we're moving into kind of unprecedented territory. We don't have analogs to this in the past. Um, again, because our most recent change in terms of magnitude was about 10 times slower. And so when you look at that, you don't really know how much of that change is analogous to what we would expect uh, over the next 100 years. Uh, but what we do see is, for example, if you look at terrestrial ecosystems, um, we see large changes in what ecosystems look like between the last ice age and the present Holocene 
time period, which again was about five degrees Celsius change. And so if you then, you know, impose that same amount of change going into the future, but 10 times faster, there is a huge concern that you would have major uh, extinction events. And the, and the reason is, is because ecosystems can't move fast enough, can't adapt fast enough uh, to keep up with that. So one way to think about the change instead of absolute temperature is you could think of uh, distance travel to stay in the same climate. So, you know, if you think about like going from Boston to New York, that's about like three degrees Fahrenheit difference. So a couple hundred miles or something. Yeah. Um, now, if you if you look at the the amount of distance that you'd have to travel to stay in the same climate uh, in the United States uh, over this century, it's about 500 miles. And so that amounts to about 75 feet a day. And so animals can move 75 feet a day, but trees can't move 75 feet a day. And, and we know just from, uh, you know, from driving across different climates that, that changes in temperature uh, by about, so we're talking about like 10 degrees Fahrenheit uh, over a lot of land surfaces in terms of 2100 under a business as usual scenario. And so that's moving 500 miles. And we know that, that, the environment changes quite a bit by driving, you know, 500 miles. And so you're basically imposing that level of change uh, over a hundred years. And so there's major concerns that, uh, that ecosystems would not be able to keep up with that. Um, some of the most sensitive systems would be like coral reefs. Um, corals tend to be extremely sensitive to temperature. Um, and then there's, I'm not, I'm not an ecologist, but I'm sure that an ecologist could, could point out, uh, other particularly vulnerable, uh, ecosystems. But I think that we don't know, you know, exactly which, uh, ecosystems will be robust and which won't. Have, uh, because we, have such we been observing, uh, in real time, any of those kinds of changes beginning to take place? Yeah, it's hard to disentangle because humans are affecting the environment in so many other ways as well. I mean, we're constantly, um, you know, changing the land surface. And so if you look, for example, in the Amazon, we're, you know, cutting down a lot of the Amazon and putting in uh, pasture and, yeah. and uh, area for food and things like that. And so if you observe some change in, uh, you know, the population of an animal, it's hard to tell if that's because of what you've done physically changing the environment there, or if it has something to do with temperature or precipitation changes. And so we're definitely seeing major changes. Um, but in terms of what fraction is attributable to the climate change, uh, it's much more difficult to, to tease out. How, how do you know, you just made an assertion not long ago that the wildfires that uh, we've been seeing in California are somehow connected to rising global temperatures. How do you know that? Um, so it's a combination of, you know, statistical analysis and basic physical principles. So as the earth gets warmer, California will get warmer. Um, and we know that the temperature or we know that for California, in the summer, as it gets warmer, it also gets drier. And so fuel aridity uh, has increased. So essentially, you know, how much, how dry and ready to burn uh, fuel is. And so the fact that that's increased means that we kind of know the sign in terms of climate change would make fires worse or potentially uh, larger. But that's not the only thing that's going on. You know, you have all sorts of uh, policy changes and, you know, things going on in terms of how, uh, how we do, how we deal with controlled burns or various things like that. And so when it comes to impacts like fires, it's certainly not the case that climate change is the only thing affecting them. Um, and sometimes it's, it's down to the only thing we can say is, is basically we know the sign. So I was about to ask you, uh, this is with respect to wildfires in California, which you said we know the direction in which climate change should take warmer temperatures, meaning more fires, but attributing causality is the question that I want. And I assume I want to ask, and I assume that there's year-to-year -year variability in the extent of wildfires in any case. 
So an uptick in a given year or even in three years might not give you that much statistical power in attributing that uptick to uh, rising temperatures, which are changing very slowly over time, albeit much faster than they had been in geologic time. So again, the question and the same question could be asked about the intensity of storms, you know, hurricanes and typhoons and so forth, which I hear people giving um, reference to when they talk about the, the threat of climate change. And I'm something of a skeptic about it just on the question of causality. I understand that, you know, climate change is not a good thing, but I don't, I just don't know whether it's implicated in year to year changes in uh, the intensity of uh, weather events or wildfires. And things like that. Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a good question. Um, essentially the one degree of warming that we've seen so far has not caused any huge signals to emerge from the noise of natural variability when it comes to a lot of these weather events. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to global average temperature, like I said before, uh, the signal to noise ratio is much larger. So we basically see a hockey stick. We see a situation where global average temperature is far outside the envelope of natural variability. But when you start getting down to weather events, like say, you know, hurricanes or landfalling hurricanes or most intense hurricanes, um, then you have this situation where there's decade to decade variability and year to year variability. And that variability so far is larger than any climate change signal. So you don't see any long-term huge trends. Um, but the models that project uh, increases in, say, hurricane activity, yeah. they tell us that we shouldn't see in the trend yet. Uh, so they, they, they're not being, like, proved wrong by any means. They accurately simulate this year-to-year -year variability and this decade-to-decade -decade variability, and they say the signal will emerge from the noise later in the century, um, but it shouldn't, be, it shouldn't be observable yet necessarily. Um, and so we have this situation where we believe, um, based on physical principles that say hurricane, the most uh, intense hurricanes will become more frequent, um, and, but we don't see a trend in that yet. And that's where we stand. I mean, I don't, I don't know what else to say, right? Like, so uh, our best estimate is that they will get more intense, but we don't see a trend. And so you just have to take that uh, for what it's worth, I guess. Okay. Can we uh, talk a little bit about what is to be done? Yeah, sure. Yeah. What is to be done? <laughs> I mean, industrialization <laughs> yeah. is not going away. I, you know, uh, at least I don't know how. Um, uh, short of some catastrophic event like, you know, World War Three or something, uh, we've got uh, developing countries uh, becoming uh, more industrialized and uh, we're seeing uh, increased urbanization and adoption of uh, energy intensive uh, ways of living by hundreds of millions, billions of people across the planet. Um, I, I see a really hard coordination problem, we call it in economics, when I've got a lot of different nation states, no one of which wants to be the one to take the first move or bear the brunt of the cost. Uh, so I'm just wondering, uh, what is it? And, and, and I might uh, just add, it seems to me that if the magnitude of the potential threat is such as it is, to talk about marginal uh, reductions in emissions is, uh, is like, uh, you know, not adequate to the problem. Uh, so anyway, this is casual observation on my part, but I'm interested in what an expert would say about what's to be done, if it, what can be done. Yeah. Well, first, I would just emphasize the challenge. It's a huge challenge. Um, and the reason is, is because, yeah, we've built our entire civilization on burning fossil fuels. So, you know, you, you may hear uh, wild, you know, optimism about wind and solar, and these things are getting cheaper, and they are starting to um, come onto the grid much faster than they were previously. But still, we're getting 80% of our total energy from burning fossil fuels uh, globally. So we're talking about really a fundamental change uh, in, our, our, in our energy system moving forward. And then on top of that, a, a big part of the challenge is the inertia in the system. So there's kind of there's social inertia in terms of people you know, actually paying attention to this. Then there's political inertia that politicians have to 
um, you know, listen to their voters and then actually implement potential policies. Then there's infrastructural inertia. So if I build a coal power plant today, that's going to be around for 30 to 50 years. I mean, that's the lifetime of these things. Yeah. And so that, that introduces a huge time lag. Then another important thing is this, uh, this difference between emissions and concentrations, where emissions are the flow of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, and then concentrations are like the stock or, you know, how much is in the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for CO2, CO2 just accumulates in the atmosphere. It stays there for thousands of years. So it's kind of like a bathtub where emissions are the faucet and the water level is, is right. concentrations. And so in order to get temperature to stabilize, not to come back down, but to stabilize, you need emissions to be near zero so that concentrations basically level off and stop accumulating. So there's, there's inertia in that where like, you know, it would take decades to draw down the emissions uh, basically to zero. And then once you hit zero emissions, that's when temperature stops rising. And then your temperature is elevated and that elevated temperature is going to continue to melt ice sheets for thousands of years because it takes a long time. These are, this is miles worth of ice. And so if you take an ice cube out of the freezer and put it on the counter, it doesn't melt right away. Right. But it, it will, it's committed to melting once you put it there. And so we think that with, uh, several degrees Celsius warming, the Greenland ice sheet might be committed to melting over the long term. So that's just to emphasize how, how large of time delays and inertia, uh, there is in this problem. And it's why people, um, emphasize action now, uh, even though what I just said about like hurricanes, that we're not even, that we're not seeing necessarily a trend, uh, in hurricanes, but people emphasize action now, um, because of these huge time lags and because of uh, how worrying it, it, or basically how big the challenge is to actually draw emissions down. Okay, but action now is not going to drive emissions to zero. That would be a complete uh, revolution in the way in which uh, billions of people are living. It just seems like that's not feasible. So yeah. what, what can actually be done? Well, it's not an all or nothing situation, right? Um, you know, wh one equation that I find helpful is something called the Kaya identity. Um, and it basically says that CO2 emissions equal global population really? times GDP per capita times um, the energy efficiency. So basically how much energy it takes to produce a given uh, amount of GDP yeah. times uh, the amount of emissions per unit of energy. Okay. And so the first term, population, that's only going to go up over the 20, 21st century. Uh, the second term, GDP per capita, we hope that that continues to go up, especially for, you know, we have a billion people on the planet that don't have access to electricity that are in basically abject poverty. Yeah. And so we want those, we want GDP per capita to go up. So then energy efficiency is increasing. So it takes less energy to produce a given unit of goods and services than it used to. And that's continuing to go to, to go in the positive direction to help us out. So that's good. Um, but it's really that last term that we need to, to tackle. So we need to get emissions per unit of energy uh, down to essentially zero. If we want to have, you know, a global, uh, society that has the people have access to energy and that we are essentially limiting emissions and limiting uh, climate change. And so that comes about through a variety of potential uh, technical solutions, you know, engineering solutions. So it's basically you can uh, try to do carbon capture and storage. So you can still uh, burn coal and petroleum and natural gas, but, but capture the carbon on site and store it underground. So that's not currently a scalable technology, but it's something that people envision uh, for the future. Um, and then it, essentially you want more renewables. You want wind and solar. So wind and solar are coming down in price. Uh, they have challenges associated with them. They're intermittent. They're variable. Um, so they don't provide as reliable an energy source as coal or um, nuclear or uh, even hydro. Um, and so they require storage of energy. They, requ they require quite a bit of storage so that when you are receiving more energy than you need, you can store it and then use it when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining.
Um, but in our group, they do modeling um, t for wind and solar for the United States to see, you know, how much you'd need uh, prices of uh, storage to come down in order for the for it to be competitive with an, a, a fossil fuel energy system. And right now, the news isn't good because it looks like storage costs would need to come down by a factor of like a thousand in order for a renewable energy and a hundred percent renewable energy system to be the same cost as a fossil fuel burning system. So we have a situation where there is a legitimate cost to dealing with climate change. It's not a win-win scenario as you might hear people argue, right? So you'll see people say, oh, you know, wind and solar provide green jobs and then it will, you know, save humanity and the planet and all yeah. this stuff. Um, but it, you know, it turns out when people actually do the serious economic modeling, no, it, it is actually a cost, at least on macroeconomic uh, GDP. But I would say it is a cost worth uh, enduring because it's, you know, it ultimately, the modeling says that it would be a, you know, a few percent of GDP uh, to actually transition uh, to a more to a to a situation where you're at least reducing emissions by quite a bit, uh, and, it, and it's an incremental thing, right? So if you reduce emissions by a little bit, you get less climate change. It's not an all or nothing uh, thing, and so it does. As you as you alluded to before, it does seem like you need um, global policy to do it because there's a free rider problem, right? That everyone wants to. Uh, emit greenhouse gases and allow everyone else to uh, ha pay the price to reduce emissions. Well, but let me question the Kaya identity. I mean, I can't question an identity. It's an identity by definition. But let me add a thought. Uh, we, you say population times GDP per capita times energy per unit of GDP times uh, emissions per unit of energy, if I understood you. Mm -hmm. Now, we think population is going up on some uh, trajectory based on human behavior, uh, and we think GDP per capita needs to go up if uh, people are going to be living on more than $2 a day or are going to have the benefits of electric power. But, but, but why does population need to go up? That's human behavior, and that, that has something to do with what we take to be the good life. And why does GDP uh, have to go up? Uh, there are other ways of living, and I'm not a Pollyanna. I mean, I'm in the south of France. I had to take an airplane to get here. I've made many transoceanic and intercontinental trips in my life. I can imagine a world in which such an activity would be a once in a lifetime, not a once every year phenomenon. I can imagine a world in which cities like Houston or Phoenix didn't exist because to make them habitable, you had to expend huge amounts of energy uh, where we were more spiritually and inwardly worrying. I'm not being a Pollyanna. I'm talking about what's actually possible for human beings to do. If we were to take seriously the catastrophic implications of continuing on a certain way of living and uh, orient ourselves not toward picking at the margins, but going to the foundation of, of uh, how it is that we live, we wouldn't give up technology, but we might decide to use it in very different ways. Am I dreaming? People call me a dreamer, but I'm not the only <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah, no, you're imagining. Um, no, what you're articulating is uh, something that, that a lot of, especially environmental groups articulate. They, are, they talk about a zero growth uh, future economy that would be sustainable. They talk about reducing human, you know, birth rates such that eventually you do not have a population that's over the, you know, supposed carrying capacity of the planet. Um, and yeah, measuring measuring the well-being of humans not by GDP but by something that that more correlates with, say, happiness. Um, you know, the, I think that's. Uh, debatable, you know, like I don't necessarily want to go back to to four or five decades ago when GDP was much lower. I like uh, the technology that we have, and I think that you know people that are in uh, poverty around the world uh, would also like to be you know join joining the party in terms of 
uh, that. And so, it, but yeah, I mean, it, there's there's a whole there's a whole range of futures that that could be possible. So um, you could have a situation where perhaps uh, population increases, GDP per capita increases, and we do we are able to get the technological fixes and uh, emissions per unit of energy decrease drastically and we can solve the problem that way. Or it could be that that's really difficult and, and the future does need to be something more like what you just articulated. And that's just very fuzzy. So that's where we're moving you know, totally away from this physical climate system that we kind of know a lot about into this very fuzzy future where we basically have no idea of what, <laughs> what society and what uh, the earth will look like in, in 150 years, 200 years. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the problems actually with dealing with this is that the costs of climate change mitigation are much more uh, salient and in the near term, right? So if you, if you propose a carbon tax, it's very easy to say, okay, that's going to cost, you know, my constituents this amount of right. money or whatever. And the benefits are so long term and much more, you know, esoteric and fuzzy and, you know, not necessarily benefiting you personally, but benefiting perhaps your descendants. Yeah. Uh, and so that, that's kind of like the fundamental dilemma of climate science communication is that climate scientists want to kind of raise the alarm. Um, but they know that the, the benefits of doing of, of implementing climate policy probably don't necessarily fall on the people doing it. They, they, they are conferred on people of the future because of these huge time lags and uh, inertia in the system. And so then there's, there's kind of a, an incentive to say, um, to kind of hype up current, you know, weather disasters as being uh, caused by climate change because you want to, bring it into the here and now. You want to say that, no, doing policy right now will help you because that seems to be, you know, much more motivating for people, even though it, it probably is the case that it's really uh, much more beneficial to people of the future uh, than it is to, to, to people today. I think it's, I think it's more, I think it's better to think of it in terms of like an investment or like buying insurance where you today essentially take a financial hit such that you're insured against potentially catastrophic outcomes uh, in the future. Yeah, but I'm not going to be alive when those outcomes come about. And yeah. It looks like we've got, and we economists are very familiar with this from long-term budgeting issues. You know, you borrow money that somebody else is going to have to pay back. Um, it looks like we've got two big problems here that I, that make me feel pessimistic about the situation. One of them is international coordination. Who, uh, which countries are going to bear the brunt of the cost? This was, you know, Donald Trump rejected the Paris Accords because he says it was a bad deal for America. Well, probably, I mean, we're pretty rich over here. Probably it would be a bad deal, quote unquote, bad deal for America if it made any sense at a global level. Um, and then we've got this intergenerational problem where people who don't have a vote or a say are the ones who are most uh, adversely affected by the actions that are being taken today and their interests have to be indirectly represented by through some kind of uh, altruism or uh, moral commitment that we might embrace. And I don't know that that's a very uh, strong foundation on which to rest. So that leaves me feeling pessimistic. Patrick, can you disabuse me of that? Uh, no, I share a lot of those feelings. Um, I mean, I do think that the Paris Agreement was a was a big step forward. You know, we've we've had precedent of doing things like this. So in 1987, we had the Montreal Protocol, which banned uh, CFCs and other chemicals that were causing the ozone hole problem, and that was a huge success. And so that's a model that we can use. Um, you know, the Paris Agreement gets us on the right track after decades of trying. It seems like, you know, just social pressure tends to work in these situations that nobody, except for apparently the United States, nobody wants to be the country that says we're holding up the deal. Um, and so, you know, I, I would guess that we that the United States will rejoin the Paris Agreement at some point. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, it does seem like that you need, and I would ask your opinion on this as an economist, 
it seems like, you know, the most efficient way would be, would be to have like a global price on carbon or a global carbon tax. Um, and then that, and, you know, I, I find that the conservatives, you know, don't tend to agree with that, but that does, it seems like very, uh, mainstream neoliberal economics it is. tax negative externalities with a Pigovian tax. Absolutely. I just happened to be in the city of Toulouse, which is the home of uh, Jean Thoreau, who uh, recently won a Nobel Prize in Economic Science, I think in 2014. Uh, he's got a book out there called Economics for the Common Good, which everybody should read. You don't have to be a mathematical whiz as he is to read that book. And he spends a fair amount of time talking about the climate problem. And there's just not, uh, and he's a neo, quote unquote, neoliberal trained at MIT just like me, I mean, believes in markets and incentives and prices and all that. It's just not, there's not any real debate. The climate scientists are agreed that the earth is warming and such. The communists are agreed that governments and committees and commissions are not as smart as billions of individual decision makers in figuring out how we economize on carbon. If you make it more expensive, believe me, they'll use less of it. Demand, demand right. slow down, and they'll use less of it in ways that we might not be able to Imagine uh, to, when we try to prescribe regulation and restraint on uh, individual activities. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying regulation is bad. I think regulation is necessary, but I think it's a, uh, uh, a second best uh, and inefficient way to try to achieve a, a huge goal like getting people to produce and consume less uh, you know, carbon intensive products. Uh, who knows the myriads of ways of uh, habits of consumption and of technologies of production that might be introduced if the real cost of carbon was what people had to confront when they decided to put gas into their car or uh, to build a power plant. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it would seem like it would induce innovation. And, you know, that's that's essentially what we need is we need technological innovation and technological uh, fixes. And so, you know, if, if this problem was easy to solve, uh, I think we would have already solved it. Indeed. And so I don't think there's, there's, a, there's a, you know, few sentence answer to the question. This is I think I've, Excuse me for interrupting you. Uh, yeah, it's a hard problem. Uh, no, what I wanted to ask, and I know we're short on time, is uh, to get your uh, musings about the credibility of the climate science community in the political arena. You're under attack by know-nothings on the right. I mean, I'm not going to mince words about that. People run around talking about all of this as a hoax and whatever. Um, but uh, there is, is there not, a kind of political correctness that surrounds the way these issues are discussed, and not only in the popular press, but also amongst you scientists yourselves? Uh, you can't agree about everything, but I have the impression that whenever someone takes a different opinion that cuts a little bit against the arguments on behalf of uh, taking climate change seriously and doing something about it, a ton of bricks falls on that person uh, for having deviated from the consensus. Uh, those uh, emails that were leaked out of the University of East Anglia actually did say what they said, and it wasn't very flattering to the idea that there's no politics uh, insinuating itself into the, the machinations of the scientific community. So, so I'm just curious as an insider, you know, what you have to say about all of that. Yeah. So I would say that there are definitely zealots in the field. Um, and I'm sure that you would agree that there are zealots in the economic field <laughs> as well. Right. So any, any, any field of academics, um, there are people that are very passionate and there are people that um, probably are not as swayable by evidence as, as you would like. You know, th there's an expression in science that says the science advances one death at a time. Yeah. And what that shows is that scientists are biased, you know, just like have biases, just like anyone else. And they, they get married to their own personal theories about how the world works or how the world should work, et cetera. Um, but I do think that there are enough, the way that the incentive structure works in science and in, at least in, in our field is that there's a huge incentive, um, to, to produce novel results and there's a huge incentive to prove others wrong. And so those countervailing factors, I think, are sufficient such that, you know, the, the zealots can't have uh, they can't take over the field because 
there's there's just so much um, there's just so much incentive to want to disagree with your colleagues and to want to show that no 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 this model made this assumption that was wrong and I'm looking at the same data and I'm doing it differently and and you get a different result if you do it differently and and so like that's the, you know that's my main drive when I'm looking when I read a paper and this is my experience with colleagues as well is that people, you know, a paper will come out and it will be kind of an eye roller or something where they think, ah, I don't really, you know, they're connecting this to this. And I don't really think that's mm -hmm. true. And people immediately get excited about like, oh, this is an opportunity to prove that wrong. And that's the way science should work. Like it should be adversarial because that's the best way uh, to get at the truth. And, you know, if you go to a conference, like the American Geophysical Union is kind of the main uh, conference for, for climate scientists you see so much robust conversation and so much arguing sure. about the details of everything. There's really not, you know, this type of like wink, wink, like we're all on the same team type of thing that, that, that the skeptics imagine. So I would just say that, you know, there's a kernel of truth in that. There are definitely scientists out there who I know would never publish anything that like kind of went against the narrative or would never say anything publicly that goes against the narrative. But overall, I think there is this um, thing called institutional disconfirmation that John uh, Haidt talks about, that um, there's enough kind of viewpoint diversity in the field and enough people wanting to prove each other wrong that overall the papers uh, do kind of reflect what the best you know, available no knowledge is. And so then when, when assessment reports are written, they're kind of surveying that whole literature, not just you know, the most extreme on one side. And so I do think that overall, our state of knowledge is pretty robust. Okay, well, uh, let's let that be the last word. And that is encouraging. Uh, Patrick Brown, uh, postdoctoral research fellow at the Carnegie Institution for Science at Stanford. Uh, I really appreciate it. I learned a lot. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot. Okay.